Wicking Vicar is known for making high-quality, comfortable clerical shirts that make great gifts for pastors. But did you know Wicking Vicar also has great gifts for your little Lutherans? Just in time for Advent, you can get a wooden Advent wreath playset to help kids learn about Christ's incarnation. You can also pick up a wooden baptismal candle playset to celebrate your kid's baptismal birthday and teach them to sing, God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. Visit wickingvicar.com to see these gifts. That's W-I-C-K-I-N-G-V-I-C-A-R dot com. Hey ladies, just a heads up. This episode contains discussion and description of domestic violence and may not be appropriate for all ears. Listener discretion is advised. And if you or someone you love is in an abusive situation, help is available. Please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233. You can text START to 88788 or chat live at thehotline.org. October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so let's get this conversation started. Listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Today we have a one question interview, which means we have a fifth lady in the Ladies Lounge virtually. We're all actually at home today because it's Saturday. <laughs> We're doing this on a Saturday, yeah. guys. <laughs> we have a fifth lady in the Ladies Lounge. Erin, take it away. Who do we have with us today? Yeah, today we have Sandra Madden joining us. And you might have heard of her through the years. She's participated in a lot of different conversations <laughs> on a lot of different ways. So you might recognize her name from Higher Things. You might recognize her name from the Synod's Task Force on Domestic Violence and Child Abuse. And you might recognize her name if you heard it as Sandra Ostapowich. She is she is now <laughs> married. And is, now she has a new last name. Uh, so her her last name is now Madden. And now she is she farms and also <laughs> does uh, some accounting work and things along those lines. But she is still someone who has. <sighs> is able to really have a, an in-depth conversation on the topic we wanted to cover today. And we really wanted someone who could bring a lot of depth to the conversation because all four of us, not, none of us feel like we uh, have a lot of qualification to really talk about this. But because of that, I think the tendency is often that we just don't talk about it. And that brings us to our classic section uh, or segment in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge, uh, the one question, what aren't we talking about that we should be? <laughs> uh, and we aren't talking about it. So we wanted to, and we wanted to have someone with us who could carry that along a little bit. And so our topic today is domestic violence. And so Sandra, here, here's the, the classic question to get us started. <laughs> what aren't Lutheran ladies talking about when it comes to domestic violence that we should be talking about? Because it's certainly not a topic I hear a lot of conversation about in any public circles, honestly. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. I, I could make it more specific, but we just aren't talking about it, period. And that in itself is the problem. Mm -hmm. So how do we start? Like, how do you start a conversation about this? Well, yeah, that, that, that's the tricky part, because it's not really, you know, one of those dinner topics that you bring up. So, hey, uh -huh. how's it going in your marriage? Is your husband beating you? you, know, <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. It, it's not a subject that anyone likes to talk about, and those who have experienced it or are experiencing it often don't want to talk about it, at least not openly. It's not a casual kind of thing you talk about. And so how, how do you bring it up? You, you know, situations like this, I try to bring awareness to it using my, my Facebook page. Every October, I post something daily just to bring awareness and spark conversations once a year. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing is that when you start talking about it and bringing it up and mentioning it in different ways, 
people start to realize that, hey, you're a safe person to talk to about this. So mm. when they do encounter a situation in their life or have a question, they the conversations kind of start organically then. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you start talking about it, people will know that you're an okay person to talk to about it. And pe- people want to talk about it, but nobody knows how to approach it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's it's just kind of opening the door just a little bit and, you know, mentioning it. Why do you think it is such a hard topic to talk about? I think a lot of times people just don't know how to react when they hear about situations. They don't know who to believe. They don't know what's true. They don't know what abuse is. There's just a lot of straight up ignorance, not in an, you know, you're ignorant, but people just don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear about situations in the news, you know, Gabby Petito, that was all over the news last Mm -hmm. year. And things come up, you know, where there's a situation locally and, you know, you hear about things and people react to them, but it's usually, oh, well, I can't believe she put up with that or, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Uh, and then the news, the media will kind of uh, play down stories and say, you know, it was a, a murder suicide. Murder mm. suicides are almost always domestic violence situations. Mm. And it's, you know, it never gets mentioned that way. Mm-hmm. But also when you bring it up, there can be some really difficult things that you will hear that people have experienced trauma that they have had and not everyone wants to hear about that from someone else. Yeah. Well, do Mm -hmm. you think there's also an aspect of domestic violence is often such a hidden private Mm -hmm. thing and there's this strong desire not to air dirty laundry? Oh, Um, absolutely. There's a lot of shame, a lot of shame involved with it. And especially, you know, if you don't fit what people stereotypically think of as a victim of abuse mm. or your abuser is someone who is has a good reputation in your community in your church mm. and things mm. like that it it makes it even more difficult mm-hmm. So we're going to get into a lot of the things that you've mentioned, like what domestic abuse actually is, what we can do if we see somebody with it. But first, uh, why don't you share your story with us, uh, the reason why we asked you here today? (laughs) Sure. October 5th, 2003 was a Sunday. And I remember that because I went to church. I was married. I had been married for about eight years at that time and had our son, uh, who was about 15 months old. And my husband at the time was Lutheran, raised Lutheran in Canada, and he wasn't on speaking terms with God because of some different things that had happened in his life. And not that he didn't believe, he just didn't want to be involved and didn't want to go to church. So I went to church by myself that day with my son and met my parents and brother for brunch, as we did every Sunday. And... He called me because texting wasn't a thing then <laughs> and wanted to go, <laughs> wanted to go uh, for a drive. We had been having some difficulties and challenges and we're going, had started thinking about counseling and, and that kind of stuff because we argued, we fought a lot. Well, there was a lot of fighting, I should say, and a lot of arguing and I had insisted on it. And so he called me up and wanted to go for a drive that afternoon and and whatever. And so, of course, I want to go. I want to work on my marriage and do the right wifely thing. And my parents are always happy to watch the baby, whatever. Except that I had a higher things meeting that afternoon, a conference call, and I was the secretary of the board of directors. So you can't Mm. just duck out on your minute taking duties and things like that. And he knew about this, but apparently forgot. And so, you know, I'm like, I really can't and so he started to get annoyed and upset because my religion and my obligations are getting in the way of his plans. And so I'm like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll call it off. I, I will duck out. Someone else can manage. And he's like, no, you've already made your decision. Okay. I guess I'm not going on the drive and I am doing my call, whatever. And so I do all that. And that evening, a friend of mine from high school that I also knew through college 
was being ordained. And so my mom and I and and Isaac had planned to go to that ordination service. And so we went and everything, you know, was normal, whatever. And I got back and go put the baby in the crib and make sure, you know, go down to his office where he's working and playing video games and whatnot and check in. Anyone call? Anything happen? Anything going on? What happened? What I miss? And apparently he had been stewing all day long because he had no response other than to shove his chair back and stand up quickly and yell at me. You just think I'm some spawn of Satan here to test your faith. What? (laughs) I just got home. I don't know what argument you've been having with me in your head, but I haven't been a part of it. So let me get caught up here for a second. Right. And there had been violence, sort of. I I never thought I was abused. I knew we were on the on the line of things. His friends had always told me, I don't know how you handle him. Like mm. ex-Marine friends <laughs> who are bigger than him. And he was a big guy, six seven. 350, wow. you know, big guy. And I knew that he had a, a reputation or a history of violence, you know, bar fights, you know, stuff that country mm-hmm. boys get into. And so I attributed a lot of his rough around the edgesness to having a different upbringing than I did. I was, I was suburban mm-hmm. girl, waspy kind of, kind of life. And he grew up in the country in Canada and things are different there. And, you know, road rage, people do that, you know, in the country and, and in Canada and, and, and things. <laughs> you tell yourself. Canada and, is the you know, last place that I would envision is like a nation of road ragers. That's me. I, I relate to Letter Kenny. It's <laughs> yeah, that, I, I see that a lot in my, my previous life, but you know, things, you know, getting into fights in the bar, you know, he was younger, he was, you know, uh, volatile. And, you know, we would have arguments, there would be a lot of yelling. And I knew the rules to follow in our household that, you know, you just don't do these things, or it's going to be a hulking out kind of temper tantrum. Hmm. And that day, he, he stood up and, and yelled at me about being spawn of Satan, testing my faith. And I'm like, Okay, hang on. Um, you are testing my faith right now, but I'm not going to say that. And I guess I didn't react appropriately fast enough because I just, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And I started, I turned around to walk out of the room and up the stairs again. And before I had gotten two steps, he had run across the room. And the next thing I know, I'm feeling popcorn ceiling in my hair. <sighs> Because he had picked me up by the neck and was holding me over his head. Whoa. And I, I don't remember a whole lot about that other than the popcorn ceiling and dangling. And I'm like, okay, so this is it. This is how I die. Wow. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I laugh about it now, but I, it, it was a very eye open experience. I, I obviously survived that moment and realized, holy cow he just tried to kill me. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I was back on the ground, I went upstairs and packed a bag and took my son and left. Wow. And never went back. I can't say I I left and never went back, but that's the short version of the long, long story of, of that. But it was then that I realized after I, I dropped my son off at my parents no explanation. Just you got to watch him for a while. I need to go somewhere else and stayed at a hotel for a couple of weeks, actually two hotels because he found me at one Mm. and I had to go find another one and had a huge epiphany ripping of the veil from the eyes about how everything else that I had been in denial about and ignored over eight years Mm -hmm. had actually been abuse from our wedding day from even before we got married Mm -hmm. food fights like KFC had messed up his order. So he threw a sandwich at me when I was in the other room because he was mad 
and, you know, just road rage. I mentioned that, gosh, if I cooked the food badly, he'd stare at me and feed it to the dog. Um, wow. It was, if, if, he, oh gosh, I had to wake up and wake him up and get everything ready. He did not hear the alarm ever. It would ring for like three hours and I would have to get up and he'd be late to work. He didn't care. I'd, you know, try and make everything smooth. So his day would go well and he'd get out the door and there wouldn't be any issues and lay out his clothes while he's in the shower Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, being the good wife. And if there was a hole in his sock or a button missing on his shirt, there would be clothes torn off his body Hulk style and a rampage through the house and the laundry room. Wow. And that's after I knew he was up in the morning almost on a daily basis by being chased down the hallway because, you know, it'd be okay, honey, it's time to get up. Your alarm's going off. You have to get to work to get your butt out of bed. You're a grown man. Why are you not going to work? You know, cause you get annoyed after three hours of waking someone up who they're <laughs> depending on for their income and things like that. And so mm-hmm. I knew he was actually awake when he was on his feet and chasing me and I could usually veer one way and he'd go the other way and, We'd go on about our day, you know, and there's countless stories like that. I mean, even his mom asked me one time, aren't you scared of him? Every man I knew who had met both of us asked me if I was safe. Every single one. Wow. And yeah, I thought I was until I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then after I left, I called my pastor. He was probably my third call. Uh, my parents, my closest friend and my pastor, Mm -hmm. and told them what had happened. And he said, okay, well, come in and talk to me in a a day or two when you're you're feeling up to it. And I never called the police. I didn't get the police involved. I should have, but I didn't. And then proceeded to research, because I I love to research. That's my my thing, about (laughs) domestic violence and what that is. And, of course, while I'm in the hotel, there's uh, the – the JLo movie about abuse had just come out on TV. Mm. And so I'm watching this completely breaking down and freaking out and realizing, oh my goodness, this could have been so much worse. And seeing all the things that I hadn't seen before. And I found all sorts of information. And we started meeting with my pastor. He, he met with both of us. And doing counseling and things like that, even though yeah, I, I had read enough that I insisted that we arrive at separate times and we leave at separate times. So I can't be followed um, mm-hmm. from those meetings and went through a horrific experience mm-hmm. with that pastoral counseling. And I, I don't want to fault the man who, who was my pastor at the time because he was doing what he, what he knew. He, he just didn't know any better. But it was horrific, and I don't want anyone to ever go through that. And mm-hmm. that's that's why I wanted to get involved with the task force, mm-hmm. and that's why I, I speak up. Because mm-hmm. I have a lot of friends who are pastors. I know a stupid amount of pastors, and I know <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I know that this is going on. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I, I want people to have a better experience. If they have to go through domestic violence, at least be able to get some decent care from your church. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we were we were separated for two years. We were separated for nine months before I ended up filing for divorce, which I didn't want to do. Um, we had been going through counseling, and I set some very clear boundaries on what needed to happen for us to reconcile. I got an apartment with my brother because I knew this was going to be a long term thing, and he oh he found Jesus. He, he was buying me theology books and going to church and going out to dinner with the new pastor because we had a brand new candidate who had been ordained from the seminary that year. So he was mm-hmm. he buddy buddy with that poor guy um, oh, well, man. And, and used it against me. You know, I look at how much I've changed. Look at how much I'm doing. I'm, this is wonderful. And it lasted two months two months before he was back to his old ways and not doing anything differently. And what he would do is he would threaten to divorce me and tell me and tell other people that he had filed for divorce. And so I'm waiting for the papers and they would never, ever come. And finally, after like the fifth time of doing this, I'm like, I'm taking away that, that ability. You're not going to abuse me with this threat anymore. And so I filed. And then that whole process took 
another year and a half, two years. <sighs> um, and it was horrible. People say that divorce is taken too lightly. And it really isn't by anyone who has actually been through one. Nobody recommends it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, nobody who actually takes marriage seriously recommends going through a divorce or that whole process. No one takes it lightly, except people who have actually never been divorced. <laughs> and the abuse continued through all that process. He started dating a lawyer, which was lovely because they came up with some creative things to try and accuse me of in court. And it was, you know, it just, it, it, we weren't living together, but it, it continued. And so, yeah, that's, that's my story right now. Mm-hmm. I suppose I could do the happier ending part is that I was a single mom for gosh, 15 years and mm-hmm. found my, my current husband or he found me. Mm-hmm. We have never had an argument in five years being together, which is complete night and day. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Life is very good. Mm-hmm. He seems like a, a good good guy. And he I'm, is. I'm so He's happy for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I have a question. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of people in your life saw the red flags mm-hmm. before you did. What do you think was barring you from seeing those? Aside from like the sense of duty and being a good wife. Right. Do you think there that, are other things at play? That was a big one. And pride. Okay. I'm not one of those people. I can handle this. I I was getting positive reinforcement as well because, you know, he's such a diamond in the rough and you're polishing him up. He has improved oh. so much since you have been in his life. And he really had. Mm, you know, you can't right. deny he had gone from, you know, post-college messing around gamer kind of guy to very successful programmer in just a couple of, you know, a few years with his life together, a house and a kid and, you know, all the things. So, yeah, I was a great influence on him. I made his yeah. life easy. I managed every aspect of it. And I, oh, yeah, I'm good at that. Um, <laughs> so pride and I was good at it. It was working. And I was not going to fail in my marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't Marriage is for life. We don't do Mm -hmm. that. I didn't know anyone growing up who had been divorced. No one in my family had ever been divorced. We didn't, we didn't socialize in my family with people who had been divorced. It was just not something that was part of my experience. Mm -hmm. So I got to blaze the trail on that. (laughs) It sounds like you had a lot of family support as you were going through this. I wish I could say I did at the time. Mm. My parents were supportive. They didn't understand everything. My mom never liked him. (laughs) (laughs) Listen Um, to your mama's girls. I know, right? (laughs) Um, No one ever really liked him. But my family was, like I said, I was the first one to be going through this and be divorcing and separated and having serious marital trouble. So there was a lot of Christian encouragement to do what I need to do and reconcile and work on my marriage and give him another mm. chance and, and things like that. I had one, one of my aunts that I was probably the closest to reminded me regularly of those obligations and that divorce just really isn't an option and you, you need to reconcile and, and things like that. And eventually to the point that I cut off contact with her mm-hmm. for a number mm-hmm. of years since then. <laughs> her own son had has been in an abusive relationship and she's seen the error of her ways. Yeah. yeah. That has changed a bit and I'm, I'm not the only one in my family now, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, 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 I did not have a lot of support, but in retrospect, my family is supportive now mm-hmm. that they understand a little bit better the situation. Yeah. What makes it so challenging for women to leave these relationships. I know that's something that (laughs) can be difficult for women who, even if they know that they're in an abusive relationship, why is it so challenging for that separation to happen? There are a few factors in that. One, it's very dangerous. The Mm -hmm. most dangerous time for a victim of abuse is when you decide to leave because abuse is not about violence. There is violence used, but control 
is the main goal of abuse and using fear and intimidation to do it is, is how it happens. And so physical violence is what everyone thinks of with abuse. Physical violence just enforces the fear and intimidation. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's physical violence, you can guarantee that there has been a lot of emotional and psychological and other forms of, of abuse going on before it gets to the point of needing physical reinforcement to be in fear. And mm-hmm. so when a victim decides to leave, the abuser is completely out of control at that point. And mm-hmm. so that is a big move to to break free of the abuser. And so the things that have to be done in order to get control back are more extreme, mm-hmm. which is where you end up with the murder suicides and the shooting rampages at the beauty salon or, you know, kidnappings and and crazy things happen when abusers are out of control and they escalate and it's it's very 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 dangerous so there's that aspect of it it can be very difficult to leave as well because of trauma bonding Mm -hmm. and as crazy as it sounds being in an abusive relationship being a victim of abuse is a a lot like having an addiction Mm -hmm. and that you know you know how to live in this in this world. You know how to survive in this in this situation, and you're told, you know, you're in, whether through direct words or implication that you have to stay for the sake of your marriage because he's going to hurt himself or she's going to hurt herself, whatever it is. The abuser is going to hurt themselves. That they can't function. You can't function. You deserve it. You actually believe that you, you know. You did this wrong, so you should you should be punished for it. You actually mm-hmm. believe the things that are being said, and you don't think that you can function, or you are so financially dependent on mm-hmm. your abuser that the logistics of getting out and finding somewhere to stay and paying the bills and putting food on the table and diapers on the baby's bottom become extremely challenging and can be insurmountable for some people. Um, mm-hmm. And so they they cho- they choose to stay until they can't anymore, really. Mm-hmm. And so there there's a lot of factors in why people don't leave. It's yeah. Yeah. it's a lot more difficult to do, even just the leaving and building up the reasons and the ability to to get out as well. Mm-hmm. What would you say to women? Well, any victim who the physical side of it never manifests. Mm -hmm. So you Mm -hmm. say that the physical part of it is almost always the shoring up of the mental and emotional and psychological behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear a lot of people in these situations that stay because they, he hasn't raised his hand to me. He's never hit Mm -hmm. me. That was me. What would you say Mm -hmm. to those women who are using physical force to, be like the decision point of (laughs) moving on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was me. He had never hit me, really. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, hold off and and beat me. That had never happened. Right. Other things had happened that I never would have really chalked up to abuse in the time because I wasn't being beaten. But I I had been sat on. I had been, you know, punched jokingly in the arm or the leg, but always with a Mm -hmm. knuckle out so it would leave a deep bruise. I had been blocked into a room. I had been prevented from getting medical care, you know, things like that, that Mm -hmm. are abuse. They are physical abuse, but I never, because I wasn't being beaten, (laughs) he would threaten me. He would look menacingly at me and hold up his fist like he was about to hit me, but he never did. Yeah, that's... The, the physical abuse is, is what everyone thinks of, too. It's not abuse unless you're being hit. Um, right. That's assault, and it's illegal for one thing. But it's, like I said, it's used to reinforce the power and control and fear. And living in fear and under someone else's control is a lot like being a prisoner of war. And it does yeah. cause PTSD. It does cause emotional damage bruises and broken bones heal in a matter of weeks but that that emotional stuff is is the gift that keeps on giving i still get triggered mm. and years later and and to those victims of abuse it it's not 
it's not like you can go through a list of things and say, okay, yeah, that happens to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't, if there's a lot of things that are happening to you, you might want to take a look at your relationship, but it's the use of fear and intimidation Mm -hmm. to gain control. That is key. And not just one time. I mean, a lot of people get confused and because this media and sometimes statistics don't differentiate between situational violence and domestic abuse. Situational Mm -hmm. violence is where you have two people who have poor conflict resolution skills. (laughs) Right. And they just feed off each other and go back and forth and things escalate and something gets thrown and someone gets hit and the other person gets hit and they're like, oh my gosh, this is, this, you know, this is, it just blew up out of nowhere. Domestic abuse is where it's a pattern Mm -hmm. and it's happening on a regular basis. There's a cycle to it, a very recognizable cycle to it that happens over time. It happens repeatedly. And the whole goal is fear and intimidation. So the abuser can be in control. I was going to ask you, you know, how could we work with a definition here? Because obviously marriage is always hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oftentimes there are strong personalities that have to work through seasons of conflict. You know, this is not unusual in a marriage that I think marriage is always a target, a spiritual target. Mm -hmm. Um, because the forces of evil in this world do not want to see a man and a woman in a happy, godly marriage. And so, you know, all marriage is hard. All marriage is is touched off with times of conflict. How would you differentiate between, say, a challenged, I won't say unhappy, well, an unhappy marriage or Mm -hmm. challenged marriage and one in which domestic abuse is happening? And is this something that just happens male to female or does it go both ways? Um, I'll answer your second question first, because that's a faster one. Okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, it is not just women who are victims and men who are abusers. Women can be abusers and men can be victims. Most often, statistically, women are the victims and men are the abusers. A lot of people don't like to hear that, but that's what the statistics say. Mm. Because of cultural norms and because of physicality, there are more women killed. If, if you take a, it sounds horrible. If you take a pile of all the women who are killed in, in a given year, a third of them, if not more, will have been murdered by an intimate partner, their current mm. or former boyfriend or husband. Wow. Usually a male. And so it's, it's, it's the leading cause of death for women, I think between like 15 and 45, wow. which is insane to think about but there is mm-hmm. a reason that we have this fear as women in has it always been sorry to interrupt is it I don't is this know. is this new that it has become the leading cause or is this i don't is this think so part of well life i in mean our fallen world i think mm-hmm. for yeah, a I th- lot of years childbirth was the leading cause <laughs> oh, wow yeah. Yeah. but you're i mean it's yeah. i think it would probably be impossible to know because people don't talk about it and they certainly mm-hmm. didn't talk about it you know 50 or 100 years ago. No. <laughs> when it was normal and accepted and good yeah. to yeah. You know, beat your wife, you know, that, mm-hmm. which is insane to think about, but it's going on in our world today in other countries. And so, yeah, it, it happens. Women are most often the, the victims of it. There are, I, I have personally known men who have been abused by women. I know that happens too. And the statistics on, male victims of abuse, unfortunately, don't differentiate between male and female abusers. Mm. So Hmm. there's also a lot of abuse going on in the LGBTQ community that Mm -hmm. isn't discussed as well. So that that's a big part of it, too. And so yeah, it goes both ways. But most often, women are the victims. Definition wise, I use a very specific definition of domestic abuse, which is available in the training modules that are Committee on Domestic Violence and Child Abuse created for the LCMS, which I'm very proud of. And you can find those at lcms.org on so under social issues and domestic violence. But the definition I use is that it is a deliberate pattern of behavior used by a person in an intimate relationship to intimidate his or her partner and thereby gain or maintain power and control. Um, and so there's some key things to remember about that, that definition is that it's deliberate. Mm -hmm. it's done on purpose an abuser would say oh i lost control i don't know what happened that's not me you know i don't i'm not like that way i didn't mean it 
and gaslighting up and down and denying and mm. all that kind of stuff. No, it's completely deliberate because they don't do it at work. They mm-hmm. don't do it mm-hmm. with certain people. They don't do it in public. They don't do it to leave visible bruises or marks. It is completely on purpose and under their control. And which is horrible to think about when you realize it's on purpose and they're mm-hmm. intending to hurt you and scare you. But it is. It's deliberate. It's also a pattern. It is not just a one-time thing. It happens. You can predict it. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a victim will be able to, <laughs> in a certain extent, manage it. If you know that he's getting close or your abuser is getting close to blowing up and having having an event, an abuse event, so to speak, and you don't want it to be too bad, you can do something to you know tip it off that hmm. you burn the dinner or you, you tell him about the dog peeing on the floor instead of just cleaning up. And something like that will be enough to do it because if it gets worse, if it gets, mm. if he holds it in too long, it's, it's going to be dangerous. Hmm. And so it's, it's pressure that, valve. It's pressure valve. Hmm. I'm not saying that a victim will do that yep. on purpose on a regular basis, but it, there, it, there's that much of a pattern to it that you can recognize what's going on. Hmm. The other thing to remember is that it has a goal. The, the entire purpose of it is to cause fear and intimidation. That mm-hmm. obedience, which is a, a tough word to talk about in Christian circles when you're talking about mm-hmm. marriage, because that's part of our vows sometimes is to be obedient. And so an abuser will use that to basically live out an entitled life. The abuser mentality is one of entitlement. I deserve this. I'm better than you. You need to serve me. You need to do things to make my life better. And a, a victim comes to accept that and say, yeah, that, that's my job. I'm a helper. I'm, I'm a good spouse. I, I will make your life better because that's what we do in a marriage. But doing it through strict obedience and control of the other person is not how two healthy adults relate to each other in a relationship. And so an abuser does what they do in order to have that control and get that obedience. And so that's how abuse is different than situational violence. That's how it's different than a difficult marriage. A difficult marriage, you have two people who want to have a good relationship, want to be healthy people as individuals who then relate to each other in a good way and build each other up and and have that relationship where there's trust and love and intimacy Abuser just wants control at the end of the day. So on the topic of marriage, and we've got our theology of marriage, we've got our theology of, you know, grace and forgiveness and so forth. And then we've also got this situation of this horribly broken relationship. How does that all square up? From what I'm hearing you saying, it doesn't sound like it can be fixed in this life. And I hear, you know, I know a lot of people are like, mm-hmm. but the, you know, the anything, the Holy Spirit can work and it can be fixed. It's way harder. Um, <laughs> yeah, so how does that all square together with, with our understanding of what marriage is? We talk about adultery. You have you have broken the vows, and and this isn't marriage anymore. It's it's been broken. Is this the same? Is this a similar thing? What does this mean when pastors are talking about? It? What does it mean when you know when we're talking with somebody and not wanting to reinforce mm-hmm. the wrong thing? How does that all fit together from a Lutheran perspective? Yeah, that's where it gets really tricky yeah. because. <laughs> Yeah, we're mm-hmm. pro marriage. We love yeah. marriage. We want Yay, people to marriage. be marriage. Yeah. <laughs> the problem comes is when we put marriage before people mm-hmm. and the institution before the individuals, that we hold up marriage so high that divorce is unthinkable mm-hmm. in any situation. And I know pastors who talk about it that way. There is never mm-hmm. any reason for divorce except adultery. Because that's what the Bible says. No, the Bible doesn't say that. We are told repeatedly in the Bible to not associate with people who don't take care of their family, who are spiteful and cause all sorts of trouble, who are violent. But if you're married to them, by all means, that is, that's your fate. And so that, that's a problem that we need to address and really think through. And I'm still in the process of thinking through mm-hmm. how, I, how I deal with that. 
But marriage is not slavery. Marriage is not intended to be slavery. Marriage in the Bible is, well, it's instituted by God, but it is, our marriages are an image of Christ in the church, which mm -hmm. is a beautiful thing. I have always been a huge fan of marriage and that imagery and, and how, in Ephesians 5, that is one of my favorite yes. passages, even while I was being abused, and especially afterwards, when I got out. It, it is one of my favorite passages because even though it uses that, that the S word, that nobody knows mm -hmm. about. What? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have submission wrong in, in so many situations. Yeah. That we just think of it as obedience. Just do what you're told. Right. And if you ask people, because I would ask kids all the time at, at higher things conferences, what do you think submission means? And it's always a negative connotation. Always, mm -hmm. always negative. being a doormat, giving in, not having, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, it's not. It is right. a beautiful thing. That has nothing to do with that because in the verse before it's mentioned, everyone submitting to one another out of love in Christ, everyone, yeah. regardless of age, sex, relationship, whatever. And husbands and wives do it in an espe especially intimate way. And wives even more so because that's, that's right. what we are as women and, and how, we, how we function. That's how God made us. And submission is about trust. You can be obedient and not trust mm -hmm. that person a bit. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any husband who actually loves his wife wants her to be outwardly obedient and inwardly resenting him. Mm -hmm. No one wants that. Mm -hmm. But that's how we understand submission so much. It, it, it's about trust and trusting that your husband is going to be a husband for you, like Christ is the bridegroom to the church, that he, without question, without hesitation, is going to give of himself for your better that he he doesn't see those flaws ever you are the most beautiful woman to have ever walked the face of the earth as far as he's concerned and nobody better say otherwise and you have no doubts or reservations that that's how he sees you mm -hmm, right. and so you trust that when he says something that it's for your good even if you don't like it and that he's always going to be doing that it's not about obedience who wants that? Go get a dog. I think we get so <laughs> hung up on the whole wives submit to your husbands Ooh. part of it that we completely blow past the first part, which is husbands love your wives. Yeah. Right. Like, right. Well, and that's, I used to wrestle with the submission word an awful lot, but as I've grown through nearly 20 years of marriage to a man who is not perfect, but does try to love me as Christ loves the church. The only response to that is to submit and say, okay, love me that way, <laughs> you know, and any other response doesn't make sense, you know, right. and I've come to, I, I think, a much greater sense of peace about that as just as you say, as you trust that your husband loves you and wants to, you know, sacrifice himself for your good. And of course, mm -hmm. in an abusive relationship, that is impossible. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Because it's all about him getting what he wants, being entitled and being served and obedience. And that's good enough. Mm -hmm. And so marriage, getting back to the broader topic of it, that's what marriage is supposed to look like is Ephesians 5. Mm -hmm. And of course, none of us are going to have that. No. In, you know, the side <laughs> of heaven, it's not going to happen. The sinners who do sinful things... And all we have is repentance and forgiveness as Christians. But the problem comes, like I mentioned before, when we put the institution of marriage over the safety, the well-being, mm -hmm. the mental health, the, you know, all those things over, over the individuals mm. and make an idol of it in a lot of ways. And I know some people say, you can't make idols out of good things. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. We're really good sinners. We can we can make an idol out of anything, <laughs> including marriage. And mm. yep. So when we have all these Christian marriage resources talking about divorce being a horrible thing that it's just not even on the table, and pastors saying divorce is never on the table, there's never any biblical reason for divorce, asking people to justify their past divorces to make sure that they were biblical to decide how you're going to treat them. It, it's just not, 
not an option. And so we have to make your marriage work. You have to, you have to, have to, have to, have to have reconcile. And my own pastor told me two weeks after this whole strangling incident that, well, he's sorry now. Why don't you go back? Woof. And I'm like, okay, um, I, I am a good Lutheran confessional woman and I want to listen to my pastor. You yeah. are an authority in my life. You are, you know, my, you, you speak for Christ in my life. And so when you tell me to do this, telling you no is really hard, but mm. no, because if I do that, then we might as well start talking about my funeral. Mm-hmm. Because strangulation is a huge predictor of death in a in a in an abusive relationship. It's it's very very dangerous. And now there's a whole kink thing going on about choking and and things that <sighs> have been porn, and that's very very dangerous. Yeah, um, because your life literally is held in the balance, and there can be serious physical repercussions that don't even show up until weeks later. And so I I had to tell my pastor no, which was very difficult for me. And I had to put my foot down on not reconciling right away that, you know, for, for a lot of women who don't want a divorce, because I think that's a lot of us, Mm -hmm. you know, even in an abusive relationship, we don't necessarily want a divorce. We want, we don't want the abuse to stop. We love that guy. It's not always bad. There are good days. He can be very charming. We don't want to fail in our marriages. And so we don't want to think of divorce either. But nobody talks about separation. That That's an option as well. And that's the one I chose is to be separated and not just for a weekend or a couple of weeks while things cool down. No, I, I was going a minimum of six months and I signed a lease on an apartment for that purpose because I knew I was messed up. And I needed to get myself some help because I was not in a position to be making major decisions about my life and marriage in that mental state. And I I knew I couldn't trust him. I knew I couldn't trust myself because I had lied to myself for so long. I couldn't trust my pastor because he was telling me to reconcile. I couldn't test, tell, you know, trust my family. I couldn't trust anyone. And I had to build that trust back up. I had to get my life straightened out. And so one of those boundaries that I had insisted on was that we each go see a therapist that deals with abuse and abusers specifically. And not every counselor out there, not every therapist has that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, Most Christian counselors do not. I do not recommend Christian counseling. I'm sorry. Um, I just don't. I don't think there usually are not enough training there's not enough specialization. There's too much blurring of the lines of vocation. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I just, I don't think it's a good idea. I know a lot of people swear by it. That's not me. Finding someone who specializes in abuse is hard. Finding someone who specializes in treating abusers is even more difficult. Yeah. But it can be done. Yeah. There are resources out there. And so I insist that we both go through a program, through a shelter that had those things. And we did, and it didn't work. Um, it worked great for me. I thought it was amazing just being in a room with people who had similar stories to mm. know that I was not crazy. Mm. Um, I was not the only one who was experiencing this. It was life-changing. And the thing with abusers, though, is that, yeah, they can change. They can stop. They can get better. You, a marriage can survive abuse and not be abusive anymore. The problem is that the abuser has to give up a lot to do that. Mm. A lot of entitlement, a lot of ideas about roles and the other person and other people in general. And usually what happens is that they they choose to find another victim instead Mm. and move on to someone else. They give up on on that. And so, yeah, it, it can happen. It very, very rarely does because- the abusers have too much to lose. Mm. So they don't. Mm. And un- unfortunately, that's the way it goes a lot of the times. And it's it's unfortunate, but I think that's the reality of it too. And and the resources that the committee put together actually says these things, which is huge that divorce is on the table. You should get divorced. It does not say that. Mm. But divorce could be 
a consequence of abuse mm. and that the abuser's lack of change, lack of willingness to give it up results in them losing their family and their marriage, possibly their freedom and, and mm-hmm. up in, in jail or something like that. And that, that is something that happens and we deal with that. And it's, it's, it's an option for victims of abuse because divorce isn't what ends a marriage. The, mm-hmm. Divorce is just the legal formality of, of what has already happened in right. the relationship. And so dragging it out just because we love marriage, that's not the kind of marriage we love. That's the kind, mm-hmm. kind of marriage mm-hmm. we want to encourage or support. So I think we, in addition to talking about abuse more, we need to really change how we talk about marriage and yeah. divorce mm-hmm. because it's, it's not cool. It's really, really not cool. It's mm-hmm. bad. Now, looking back, thinking back to your story, you mentioned that you wish you had called the cops Mm -hmm. the night that physical violence became too much for you. Mm -hmm. In general, knowing what you'd know now, what would you have done differently throughout your abusive relationship? I mean, just at various stages. Yeah, at the yeah. beginning, had, what would you, what would you have just done differently as it escalated? And then at the end, how would you at different stages in this story have done things differently if you had the wisdom that you have now? Right. Well, on the one hand, you know, it, it's all led to make me who I am today and give me right. the things. That so that's all. <laughs> I would not trade that. It's all worked out great in the end. I wouldn't have gotten married. Mm. I would not have married him because I knew. <laughs> I, I knew that very day. Because we were at the church, we had done the premarital counseling and done all the things, even though we had had these fights beforehand, no red flags. We were at the church on our our wedding day, and he mentioned to me earlier that morning that he didn't want to kneel during the service. And I needed to tell the pastor he didn't want to kneel, because he was on talking terms with God, but he just didn't want to kneel. Okay, whatever, big boy. (laughs) That was in my head. Um, And I'm like, okay. Um, you're more likely to see the pastor than I am that day because getting ready and all the girl stuff that goes on at the church and all that. I'm not going to see him to have a conversation with him. You're standing around. You have a conversation with him. And so we get to the point in the service. I just assumed that they had talked because they had been talking one-on-one throughout the day that I saw, you know, from a distance. He had to kneel in the service because he didn't have that conversation. I didn't have that conversation. So as soon as we were out of the sanctuary and in the narthex, I was being read the riot act oh. because he had to kneel in the service and I should have stopped it. I did this on purpose to make, make him go against his beliefs and da 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 Yeah. And he couldn't control the pastor like he could control you. Well, he didn't do the adult yeah. thing and have the conversation no, with he the was guy. a coward. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it was my exactly. fault because I was supposed to have dealt with it and made his mm-hmm. life smooth and easy. Mm. Man, mm-hmm. child, no offense, <laughs> actually, full. Yes, no <laughs> mind. Sorry, <laughs> I can't and, deal with this uh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. I mean, it was to the. I mean, it, he didn't like physically do anything that. But I was oh, I was read the riot act until people started coming oh. out. And then we had to drive over to the reception place, and I get there, and I'm getting in the car the entire way too. All over this one little thing. <sighs> and to the point that I, I walk in the hotel and I'm like, where's the bar? <laughs> I right. need a drink. This is dumb. It's supposed to be a happy, um, joyful day. Oh, I'm sorry. To be. Yeah. And it wasn't. And so I, I, I knew I had made a mistake. I, I knew this was not going to. This is my life now. Mm. That is exactly what I thought. This is my life now. And so I tried to make the best of it mm-hmm. because I was married. Mm-hmm. And you don't just walk away from a marriage. You you make the best of it. You you make it work. You do the things. And I did. I was yeah. really good at it. <laughs> I was good. Um, I spoiled him rotten, according to all his friends. Little did they know that I had to do that or I'd be in trouble. And so there are so many things. I would have put I would have had boundaries. I would have spoken up. I would have said no. Please don't fart on me when we're laying on the couch watching movies. You know, I, I would have Probably. said these things. You know, it, it's stupid little things like that that happen that are just control. Mm-hmm. Control. And, you know, 
it, you can't rip off your clothes and storm around the house and get, get your butt out of bed and go to work like an adult. You, you don't want me to work. So you got to go to work. You know, mm. one of us has to probably with a better attitude than that. But, you know, I, there was so many things I would have done differently in retrospect. I would have involved the police at other times, not because of the physical violence, because there wasn't really physical violence. But when you throw a vacuum cleaner down the stairs, Ugh. that might be something to be, you know, think about. Yeah. Um, you know, we had even, we had adopted our son and did our home study with a hole in the wall from where he punched Ugh. over my shoulder. And they're like, oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> we should never have been approved. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. goodness. But we were. And my, my son is awesome. He's a great kid. But, you know, there's so many things in retrospect that I would have done differently and spoken up or set boundaries or never gotten into the situation in the first place. But that's something you learn and with time and wisdom and maturity and age and all that kind of stuff. So your son is an adult now, right? Yes. So as a mother who has who is a, survi- a survivor of abuse, like how mm-hmm. has that as he's probably dating or is married or is affianced or whatever, like how, like, how do you, how have you raised him to make sure that he's not repeating that sort of pattern? Right. Well, fortunately he wasn't in it for, right. mm. for much when he was, he was just a baby and he would react to the yelling and that was not cool. Mm. But I have been open with him about the reasons that I am not with his father that he was probably 11 or 12 before I told him that. And he still has been pro dad. Most, you know, he's yeah. idealized this idea of dad. Cause mm-hmm. they have really hasn't had a whole lot of contact with him out of sight, out of mind. Mm-hmm. Easy um, to do. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately for him, but we have very open conversations about uh, relationships and sex and mm-hmm. what is a healthy relationship, how to treat women how to be a gentleman. And actually <laughs> I can credit my husband with a lot of how he has behaved in his, he doesn't have an extensive dating past. He's, he's just 20, um, but he's been on dates and he has picked up from my husband to do the, open the doors and oh, uh, do be very polite and do all the things. And it, it's, it's great. He's a great influence. And it's, it's so fun to see him do that. Is, is kind of mirroring it because it, it could have been other things that he was learning and it, it, it's wonderful, but we just talk openly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I always have. I think that's what you do is, is as, as a parent and mm-hmm. when there's no one, no backup, there's single mom. We just got to talk this yeah. out because I have no other options. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know we only have a few minutes left, but would you be willing to share the story of how you met your current husband and how you knew (laughs) that you were ready? (laughs) And at this to like make it real with this man because I am wanting to time. I also would love it as you're going along, you would describe the the difference. Yeah. Because obviously getting out of an abusive marriage is really hard, but you can avoid getting into one in the beginning if you know what should we look for in terms of red flags? As the mother of teenage daughters, please clue me in yeah. on mm-hmm. how I can avoid any of my daughters having the experience that you had. Again, starting with the second question, because that's easier. All right. <laughs> it's more on the tip of my, we'll go chronologically kind of. In okay. Way. As far as preventing it, avoiding it, raise your kids to be strong and speak up for themselves and have boundaries mm-hmm. and be able to recognize when somebody is crossing boundaries no, you don't need a password to my phone if we're just dating. You know, we're teenagers. You, no, I don't have to check in with you and tell you where I'm at. No, I'm not going to break my parents' rules and sneak out of the house to go meet with you. Mm. Sneakiness, all those kinds of power and control, fear and intimidation things apply in dating relationships as well. And there's this mentality that I just do not understand among teenagers, I think, trying to be more mature than they are that they mm-hmm. take their dating relationships very, very seriously. I think it's part of the developmental emotional thing too, but yeah. they try to think of their dating relationships as, as kind of a mini marriage. Mm-hmm. 
and with intimacy and closeness and let's work on a relationship. No, no, I'm sorry. You're, you're just dating your, your teenagers. It no (laughs) marriage is marriage and dating is dating and you don't get the rights of a married person if you're only dating. Exactly. And that doesn't just apply to sex. It applies to intimacy. Mm -hmm. It applies Mm -hmm. to priorities, um, everything (laughs) that if, if someone is not meeting your standards, someone is breaking your trust. Someone is not someone you can rely on. You don't have to try and make it work. You don't have to stay with them. You're just dating. This is where Mm -hmm. you learn about developing these, these techniques and recognizing these red flags and walking away because you can, Mm -hmm. because you can absolutely, if if they're not meeting the standards, throw them back there. You can move on, meet someone else. There's a whole trend in conservative Christian, whatever, homeschooling a lot about courting instead of dating. And I think that's really dangerous actually, because it doesn't Mm. give that opportunity to learn and say no, because you're immediately in this relationship where you're probably going to marry this person that you barely know, don't get to spend any time alone with, have no physical contact with, don't know, you know, what you're getting into and have no way to figure it out. But you're going to marry that person and you're going to make the best of it. Dating is to learn how to have a relationship and have healthy boundaries and enforce those things and figure out what you want in another person and how to be that other person in a relationship. And it it doesn't have to be about marriage. I mean, yes, we want to to marry eventually, but we shouldn't think of every dating relationship as a potential marriage relationship. It's a learning experience, hopefully a positive one for the most part. So watch for those same things of abuse in and dating relationships as in a marriage, because you can walk away and you can learn from it and move on and do better. As for me in my experience, I didn't date for like 15 years after, after my separation, because I was not in a mental place to do it. I didn't trust myself in finding a new partner for a long, long time. I knew I had ch- my, my chooser was broken and mm. I didn't want to put myself in that situation. I didn't want to put my son through that. Mm. And I was busy raising him and working and doing the things. I was busy. I didn't have time for it either. Mm. And so he finally got to the point, uh, my son, he's like, I want you to find someone who oh. makes you happy. And I'm like, you know, I think I'm kind of at the place where I I might be able to experiment with that a little bit. I'm super introvert. I don't like people. I don't like meeting new people. (laughs) But, you know, this could be research. And I I can think of it as research. And so I (laughs) signed up online dating things because I knew I wasn't going to find what I wanted. in. obviously, I hadn't in my regular life especially because I don't like to go places. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm online. I've been on, yeah, that's, that's my thing. And so um, signed up for a few online dating places and talked, chatted with a lot of people. Some of them, yeah, that was a quick decision. No, I'm sorry. Literacy is rough. Uh, it's <laughs> me. Um, <laughs> if you can't spell correctly, <laughs> or type a complete sentence or are just trying to hook up, just not interested. Sorry. Good woman. Yeah. yeah. Grammar is essential to a it good is. relationship. It, it is. Oh. Same standard. Yes. <laughs> and so, you know, there were some that were able to carry on a conversation and I'm like, okay, yeah, let's go meet for lunch, you know, public place. And, you know, some of like, oh, you really aren't ready to be dating to the way you talk about uh, your ex-wife and how badly she treated you and da, da, da. I really don't want to hear about her. But if that's what you want to talk about, we won't be meeting again or talking anymore. And, you know, just meeting them in person. Yeah, there's there's nothing there. You're much better in chat. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And there was there was one guy who was interesting. He had a sense of humor, different. And we hit it off and went out a bunch of times and that was fun, but didn't end up working. It was, it was fun. I I learned things and yeah. And that, that, that was good enough. And then, then I, I encountered my, my, the man who would be my husband and we just started chatting 
And that first, from our first conversations, this is different. Mm-hmm. There's something mm-hmm. different. He's making me laugh. Mm-hmm. Not only is he literate and has mm-hmm. like a vocabulary, <laughs> but he's he's cracking jokes and he is so quick witted. Oh my gosh! To you know, I I think I'm fairly clever person and I have some witty comebacks every now and then. <laughs> he puts me to shame. And <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, this this is this is one I want to meet. And so you know, we we're, we probably chatted for about a week before. Cause I was out of town. Otherwise it would have been sooner until we, we had had our first date. And that first date was the best first date ever. Oh. It, was, oh. <laughs> it was amazing. We hit it off. We, we closed down the Mexican restaurant and went to this brew pub thing across the parking lot, closed that place down. But the best part <laughs> <laughs> was that we were sitting there watching another couple who were clearly on a first date that was not going well. <laughs> um, you know, was, and we were just we were having a great time we were telling stories laughing all this kind of stuff and just totally hit it off and we have been inseparable since oh um, he still cracks me up he's got the quickest wit i have ever 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 seen gets him in trouble sometimes i'm sure but i think <laughs> about it. and he treats me like a queen mm. i open doors for myself. It seems like such a little silly thing. I don't, I don't have to, because he's always got it for me. He calls me beautiful. Like it's my name and, you know, talks me up to other people always has my back. Always, always is, is supportive and encouraging and telling me, you know, how much he appreciates me and the things I do for him. (laughs) And he, what can he dress himself? He can do laundry. He cooks. He cleans. <laughs> he gets all the gas. Yeah, he's a grown. Up, he's a grown up man, Good. and he didn't need me. But we, neither of us needed each other. Mm-hmm. But we work together well because we are both healthy, grown up individuals who accept responsibility and share, you know, household management and all this kind of stuff. We're together all the time. We only have mm-hmm. one car now because. We go to work together. We come home together. We go out together. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's totally different. We have never had an argument. We have disagreed. We have been frustrated with each other. Mm-hmm. And we'll say, I'm kind of frustrated right now about this. I'm going to go take a minute and I'll talk to you again, you know, in a few minutes and I have a break and then we're going to fix this. And we have a conversation about the things we disagree about and the things that frustrate us like grown up healthy adults do. Mm. Yes. Imagine that. It's amazing. (laughs) And we have been through some challenges. Our kids, oh my gosh, our kids have been some challenges. But, you know, you you do what you got to do and you face them together because Mm -hmm. that's what you do in a healthy marriage. And it is night and day from my, my previous one. I, 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 he's never raised his voice to me. He's gotten short when he's been Mm -hmm. stressed out with work and stuff like that. But no. And unfortunately, yes, I still get triggered. Yeah. You know, you know, when those times when he's short, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. You know, mm-hmm. I, I have these internal reactions that have no basis in, in current reality. None whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It's all just my history playing mm-hmm. into it. And I recognize that and I'm able to tell that to him. I'm reacting this way because of me. You reacted appropriately. You, you know, you're and we have these conversations. It's it's just the craziest thing. But I, I highly recommend marriage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I wish we had met, you know, decades earlier and, and all mm-hmm. that, but neither of us would have been the people we are or we were when mm-hmm. we met that have made us who we are today and yeah. work so well together if we had done that. So, you know, it is what it is, but there is hope, you know, after abuse there, there, there can be life, there can be success. Um, there can be thriving and, and love and all those kinds of things. So it's it's not abuse is not the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Sandra, it's been so great to have you on the podcast to share your story. It's such a needed topic. I'm very glad we we're able to put this out there. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so we'll have some stuff going on in our Facebook group. And of course, we'll share the link to the LCMS mm-hmm. task force information at yeah. lcms.org. If you we'll share the link, but if you want to just go there, it's at lcms.org under social issues and domestic violence. Everything is right there. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sandra. Thank you for having me. And thank you for talking about this. Absolutely. 
Join us in our Facebook group. Uh, we'd love to hear your stories, ladies. Join us in our Facebook group, The Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can also follow us on Instagram at Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can sign up for our e-newsletter if you want to have The Lutheran Ladies Lounge in your inbox. If you're not on social media or you just like to keep up with all those things happening, we do put some extra stuff in that e-newsletter that you don't get in our social media. So sign up for that. You can find out how to do that in the show notes for this episode, or you can send an email to lutheranladies at kfuo.org. Find all of our podcasts at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app or on the KFUO radio app. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a review for us, too. If you love the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast, consider financially supporting our producer, KFUO Radio, so we can keep doing what we do. Find out how at kfuo.org slash give.